Hello, and thank you again for tuning in to Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. I'm your host, Jay-Z, and this one's going to be a fun one. So right now, I apologize in advance for a little bit of the inconsistencies when it comes to the quality of the podcast. So I first got the idea of doing the podcast back in October of 20, well, more like mid-September of 2020, and the first person to actually do a recording was... Uh, Our friend Cassandra, who used to work at the Denver Zoo, now lives in uh, Australia working on her advanced degree, and she did our Reptile Spooktacular there about flying foxes, and after that, she uh, hung out there at the Nature Preserve, uh, you know, and we did a whole podcast. So it's actually the very first one that we recorded, so the quality isn't quite as good as we would like, but I think it's still really great, and I hope you enjoy it. Also, just as a reminder, this podcast, this podcast, this podcast is brought to you by Jay-Z's Reptiles Merchandise and Store. So keep us in mind if you have any interest in doing like an online reptile and education show, as well as check out our merchandise. We have just in brand new Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast uh, silicone wristbands. As if you guys have watched any of my videos, you can see that I'm currently decked out and I finally have enough to look like Jack Sparrow minus the weird hat and eyeliner. So we have those. We have a couple different styles of t-shirts, including the regular plain logo on all black shirts and unisex, as well as we have our amazing uh, Colubrid shirt with a great quote on there made by our local artist here in Arvada, Colorado, in several different sizes in both unisex and women's in colors. And it is a little bit limited right now, but we have more on the way. Uh, Hopefully we can sell more to make more because that's how that works as well as we have a couple really great designs coming in a couple different stickers both the logo and the Roy- and my royal family crest stickers some bandanas i think i have a couple masks left and just as a reminder i do donate 10 percent of all t-shirt sales to a particular organization charity or business a couple times a year Right now, I only had it going through January, and it was actually 20% of sales to the Denver Zoo because, as you know, a lot of places are struggling due to COVID, and Denver Zoo is one of those, especially because animals, they're 24-hour residents. They need help being fed, and without the you know consistent visitors and guests helping pay for that, they're kind of struggling and hurting a little bit. So for all of January, I did 20% of t-shirt sales. I will continue that through the month of March. Uh, and I will, you know, I wasn't going to attend. We'll keep it at 20% for t-shirt sales will be donated to the Denver Zoo. So if you have any interest in those, please hit me up, jayzsreptiles at gmail.com, Facebook, Instagram, and I hope you enjoy the show. Joining us today is someone who we talked to about the flying foxes earlier. Uh, She's someone who we met uh, still while she was here in Colorado. And now she is living in Australia, working on a bunch of really cool stuff. And we're going to talk to her right now. This is Cassandra Bougier. Hi, guys. Yeah, my name is Cassandra and I'm a PhD student at the University of Newcastle here in Australia. And um, my research is uh, focusing on the prey preferences of hunter-gatherers. Cool. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I guess we can get started on how we met. So Mm -hmm. it is my understanding that you were a client of my partner, Rebecca, while you were still living here in Colorado, correct? So we actually went to high school together. Oh, okay. So there we go. (laughs) <laughs> off on a little bit that one. I was a little confused about that, but uh, you were working at the Denver Zoo, right? That's correct. Yes, I was a bird keeper. Cool. Did you, um, while at the zoo, did you work in specific areas with the different birds, like when Bird World was still up and running, or uh, what exactly did you do while you were there? Yeah, so I started out as a uh, lorikeet intern and worked with lorikeets for a while, and then. Um, sort of went up through the ranks at that point and ended up just floating around at different areas. Uh, so started in lorikeets, worked in lorikeets, worked in bird propagation. So where the nurture trail is in that building, uh, also worked with penguins as well, and then worked with um, waterfowl as well. So with That's the really flamingos. Cool. cool. I think we went and actually, and you kind of showed us around a little bit and talked about the penguins too. When I think right before you, left i believe yeah how long ago, that's right how long ago was that 
Uh, that it will be three years in May. So I oh. can't do the math at that point. Wow, that's a long time. Okay, cool. All yeah. right. Well, um, and so originally you're from Australia? That's correct. Yes. Okay, cool. I'm was... just, just trying to get all the details squared away. No worries. Yeah, cool. so um, I moved to the States when I was 10 years old. And then when I was 28, decided to leave to come back to Australia. Okay, is that where you know where you feel the best at home or where you're most at home? Yeah, definitely. So when you, uh, with your PhD there uh, at Newcastle, which is in New South Wales, um, which I know for a lot of people that they don't really know what that means when rel in relation to Australia. Um, so with uh, talking about predator prey preference. So can you talk a little bit more in detail about what exactly all that entails and what you're like, so eventually what you're going to go for your dissertation or something like that? Sure. Yeah. So what it is, is I look at um, what, so this even goes to sort of prehistoric. So, you know, more like, let's see, so Neanderthals and then like anatomically modern humans and then going to modern humans. So it's sort of going back as far as possible within the fossil record to see what, um, you know, people were hunting and, you know, what they ate and everything like that. And then, you know, sort of looking at what we do now in terms of hunting and gathering and that's, you know, the communities uh, along the equator, what they're doing. Um, and then also to what we're looking at is uh, chimpanzees as well, because chimpanzees are our closest genomic cousin, but also they are used as a model to predict hunting patterns of uh, prehistoric hominids as well. So basically what I do is I uh, look at what the kill records are, what species are being killed, and then also to the abundance uh, within that particular location. And a lot of it is done through um, you know, looking at peer reviewed papers and that sort of stuff. Um, but then also to talking to people who actually go out and do the research over there in, in those parts of the world. So, um, and that's mainly for uh, chimpanzees and modern uh, human hunter gatherers. So, uh, and the rest of the stuff is talking to researchers and using the fossil record for the rest of that research. So, uh, a lot of it is math and statistics based, but what I like I what my hope is is to show the patterns of human hunting you know sort of um take away some of the myths you know it's always like the you know the large ungulates that are being hunted and you know that sort of stuff I want to show that hey listen we're broad in terms of our you know hunting capabilities and everything like that and also you know promote conservation efforts in that way um you know it's not conservation efforts just for the animals themselves, but also for these communities around the world, because they are still retaining the, the traditional way of life. And also, you know, they are elements of, you know, they're different cultures and they're different aspects of our humanity and they deserve to be protected, you know, just as much as our culture is to be protected as well. Right, exactly. Cool. Um, so what exactly, I mean, what kind of started you off uh, down that path so like when you were a little girl what exactly did you want to do when you grew up and how did it kind of evolve into this really cool uh, essentially part of science that I was really for the most part kind of ignorant about it's um it's interesting you ask that because I started out really broad in terms of what I wanted to do like when I was five years old I was like okay cool I want to work with animals and I want to save animals that's it like you know it was really no sort of pathway you know in terms of what I exactly wanted to do um you know granted I also wanted to be a firefighter too but that obviously is not never going to happen <laughs> so the thing is though uh you know I just wanted to you know, save all that I could and leave a legacy behind. And then it kind of steered me in a way. So, you know, did my undergrad and then still kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. And then, um, you know, went and did wildlife rehabilitation and did zookeeping, uh, like volunteer work there as well. Um, and then, you know, sort of worked my way up through the ranks through zookeeping stuff. And then I was like, okay, cool. So I ended up doing a master's during that point as well. 
um, and that was working on the human animal relationship and it started fueling this thought where it was like okay well you know not everyone shares the same ideals of you know wanting to save animals and like you know but and then there's also all these other things that go along with it too you know companion animals versus wild animals and it just became this kind of thing well we all got to kind of get on the same page and then this opportunity came up uh, to do the PhD through Twitter of all places um, <laughs> and I was looking at it while I was you know hosing one of the exhibits at the zoo and I was like well shit this is kind of what I want to do <laughs> so um, yeah but it's always been that focus of bridging that human animal gap because that's something that we kind of I feel are straying away from you know and if we want to save animals we kind of got to understand about them first you know and yeah there's we can't necessarily remove that element of humanity in it so um yeah that's kind of been the pathway that I never really saw myself take it was more like okay I just got to save animals away from people and now it's like no I kind of got to bring the people back into it <laughs> so that's actually really really cool it's in all honesty it's been kind of popping up a lot um just overall in general and specifically here back in Colorado um, like, so with the introduction of wolves coming back into Colorado, um, there have been, you know, recorded, uh, the presence of wolves, a small pack, even the presence of pups, whether or not they've established a true, uh, range in Colorado or not, but it, it was, on, it's on the ballot for, you know, at the time it's recording, it's right before November 3rd here, uh, about the reintroduction of wolves, but that's a really big factor that I'm starting to see that there's, everyone wants to kind of save the wolves or have it but as you said not everyone's on the same page of how to do that and so listening to kind of more rural type farmer blue collar people who are worried about you know loss of livestock and um, federal and state compensation for that and other things like that as well as you know reestablishing proper ecosystem balances and things like that and even though it's been shown that it does work and it does establish and reestablishes things, but not everyone's on the same page. So it's really cool that, you know, as someone also who kind of originally was really interested in animals and then wanted to work with them and trying to bridge into conservation, but there's that human element that it doesn't matter what you do, as long as that human element exists, then you need to kind of, as you said, bridge the gap, which is just really, really cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. It's, um, it's definitely, it's rewarding. Um, there's, it's, uh, you know, when you sort of connect to people, you know, I mean, I tend to talk to a lot of, you know, communities and that sort of stuff and um, being able to talk to people about their attitudes and sort of seeing, you know, how there's a way to sort of flip it. And, you know, education is definitely one of the things that's most important about that whole process of, you know, bridging the gap, because, you know, a lot of the stuff is secondhand knowledge that we get, you know, whether it's, you know, oh, you know, I don't ever want to look at that snake or oh, snakes are gross or, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, those sort of attitudes that people have. And it's like, okay, but wait, did you realize that snakes also, you know, um, you know, they help the rodent population keep it in check and all of these other things that, you know, you may as well benefit from it. So, um, and that's just one example. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of these types of attitudes that we have and all of this misinformation that we have too. And so, trying to get that back on track is um, I think it's going to be very important for conservation efforts. Yeah, exactly. So when you, when you talk about like reaching out and speaking to communities, so what exactly, you know, do you, do you do exactly when you do go out and you speak and when you're working on your pro uh, and when you're working on your doctorate and you're speaking with people, how exactly does that go? Like, what do you bring up and try to convey and, and try to, I mean, what exactly do you do? Sorry, I'll just keep on rambling. Yeah. No, no, no dramas. Yeah. So oftentimes it's, you know, whether, a, a, you know, not really a party, but like at a, you know, sort of networking event, you know, people ask you what you do and you talk to them about, you know, what you do and they're like, oh, cool. You know, so do you get to work with this and that sort of stuff? And it's like, no, so I get to work with a wide range of this sort of stuff. And then, you know, go through the whole process of, um, you know, talking about, things that I'm passionate about and and whatnot and it often turns into this kind of really cool engagement where people want to learn more about it 
And so then obviously I start, you know, I ramble and I go on and on about it because it's just something that's so important and something that's going to be, you know, a continuing issue going forward. So to get as many people on board as possible and to be able to have these types of conversations, just, you know, even with the stranger across the street, I mean, um, it, it's the little actions that really make a difference too. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what um, I, I like to say to things where it's the more that the little things that you talk about to where eventually it'll be like if you're scroll on Facebook or Twitter and there's some weird article about uh, a new orange species of dwarf caiman that they found in, in Africa and you go, oh, hey, that's what that one weird reptile guy said. Or I remember they were talking about that when my kid was watching PBS or whatever it is and it's those little things that slowly kind of, you know, that you would hope, you know, trickle and snowball and kind of gain momentum. And then hopefully we can get further and help spread, as you said, misinformation, which I know is a bit of a hot word these days, but yeah. Yeah, it really would help with that. And that's just really cool that, you know, someone who started off so, you know, just kind of general and helping with the animals, you know, realize what another step that everybody kind of needs to be on the program it is reach that point where you know education and and talking about things and getting people talking is just really really cool yeah and um one thing to actually piggyback off on that as well is um so there's often that stigma about zoos as well and that's mm -hmm. one thing that sort of just kind of wanted to um you know kind of shed light on is especially after working in a zoo is that, you know, you just make sure that they're an, an, an accredited institution, um, but also they're a valuable source of information as well. So that was another way of doing some type of community outreach as well. I used to do the, um, the penguin talks, uh, you know, when they would do the penguin feedings at 10.15 and 3.30. Don't know why I still remember <laughs> that. <laughs> but, you know, it was just a way to engage people to talk about even you know, seafood choices or, you know, again, it's those little actions, but um, yeah, that's one thing that just kind of wanted to clarify was that, you know, not all zoos are bad or, you know, that sort of stuff. And, you know, the fact that it can be a valuable source of information for, you know, different species that you may not otherwise see in the wild. So. I'm actually really yeah. glad that you brought up the zoo thing again. That way I didn't have to circle around to that too. Cause um, you know, that's, that's where a lot of this gets going, which hopefully, and I'm just going to keep this going and keep this totally circular. So um, what I spend a good majority of my time reaching out to people outside of people who just keep and breed reptiles is, you know, how people get started is there's always that, you know, that weird guy who comes to your school who has the big albino python and you go, wow, what's that? That's crazy. And then you drag your parents to the zoo and then you start to see that. And then it evolves from there. So then you get your own little bearded dragon or ball python, and then you go to school for that. And then it slowly branches. And that's how a lot of people get their starts when you go forward into biology, conservation, all these other land management, everything else. And that's how you get your start is with those small little outreach education programs. And so that's what I try to do when I'm sitting there talking to somebody who rescues wolves why a dude who has a, a hundred snakes in their basement is talking to them about their wolves so i'm really <laughs> glad that you had brought that up and you know when we talk about conservation and things like that um that zoos aren't necessarily what they were a hundred years ago where it was small little boxes behind bars where you know it's moving forward these might be the only way that these animals still exist on our planet the programs they do worldwide species survival plans stud books and everything like that where there's you know you can still see some negativity thing negative things associated with some of the individual animals but the work that you know aza and world accredited facilities are doing for everybody and it's just i'm really glad that you brought that up because that's always something that i find myself essentially kind of defending throughout the day Definitely, definitely understand you. Yeah, do the same, especially on social media where everybody's just like, oh, you know, 
well not everybody that's an overgeneralization but you know there's a lot of people who still have that kind of they've watched blackfish once and it's just like oh no you know everything's bad and it's like well but but here's this this is a consequence of this you know and that sort of stuff and so I mean the um they call it the Pshavalsky or the Mongolian horse is a perfect example of you know in zoos like what, cons- what conservation efforts are you know I mean these guys were extinct in the wild and now there's introduction programs of these uh horses being released you know back into you know Mongolia and surrounding areas so it's um yep. it there are it, there are remarkable projects so yeah yeah exactly and that's those education programs and talking about everybody from you know I mean, literally anything where it comes to, you know, the little snake that you have been taught to, you know, hit with a shovel to things like that, to large macro predators that form as keystone species in the world that we need for human beings to be able to survive or even enjoy things further. And so that's just really cool that you've been able to be a part of kind of every little step along the way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's um. It's an interesting pathway. Uh, conservation, uh, like, you know, going into this pathway, there is definitely no one linear path. It's definitely a spaghetti effect. So, Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've definitely noticed that too. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, no problem. It's, I'm just really glad that I was able to, you know, kind of talk to you about this. Um, I don't know how well I can incorporate this back in with ball pythons, but that's okay. I was just really glad to be able to kind of have an actual kind of honest conversation with somebody, you know, that can see the path who's taken, as you said, not a linear path who started out somewhere and ended up in a place that they didn't necessarily see themselves 10, 20 years ago, but is still all kind of related in this big web of people and animals. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I guess one way that I can tie in, you know, whether it's ball python or any type of reptile right. here is that, you know, so there's often that stigma that, you know, oh, you know, every, you know, everything in Australia will kill you and that sort of stuff. And, you know, to a degree that may be true if you're an <laughs> idiot and actually actively looking for it. But for right now, like I'm in an area where there's probably, you know, a couple of you know venomous snakes and you know different types of spiders and you know everything else but you know I don't see them because you know they're they're doing their thing out you know in their areas yep. and you know I'm not actively searching out to hurt them or to you know investigate so yeah so I guess my I guess take home message to that is Australia's only deadly when you go looking for it so <laughs> Right. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know the exact stats. I'm kind of talking out of my butt a little bit, but aren't there less fatal envenomations of reptiles in Australia than there is in the States on a yearly, on an annual basis? I, I would definitely say that's probably true. And yeah. the other thing too, is that, you know, we, there's a lot of, um, what is it? anti venine that we have for our certain species. And so mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, people get adequate care when they go out and, you know, accidentally get bit or maybe on purpose. I don't know. That's their prerogative. But yeah, we have the resource we have the resources to be able to uh assess those situations if they do come in. Cool. Yeah. Um, any wacky for the for the Yanks here, wacky Aussie stories or anything like that? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> Did I open a can of worms? <laughs> when is there not like oh gosh um yeah i'm trying to think of it if there's anything lately well i mean you've been standing out in the bush for over an hour and nothing crazy's happened yet so <laughs> no no um i've seen some really cool like i mean millipedes and um you know all sorts of cool parrots and stuff but like yeah i'm trying to think if there's been any wacky stories oh I'm supposed to go frogging later today. So if there's anything that happens during frogging, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, hey, that's fun. Herping for me has been kind of a bust this year, other than what they call the tarantula migration. Um, other than that. How is that? 
Uh, it's actually really cool. Um, I'm going to throw up a video about it. Um, I don't know if it'll come out before or after this segment that we're talking about right now, but um, you know, it's not the migration. It's just those sexually mature males just going crazy looking for the lady and then hopefully not getting munched before they get to succumb to their uh, vast deference or whatever. But it is really interesting because um, there are parts of southern southeastern Colorado, uh, which I don't know if you ever got a chance to do. Um, yeah. Oh, you did? But, yes. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Um, it's just fun to sit there and watch. And then depending on the time of day and the ground temperatures and stuff like that, two, three, every hour at least, just cruising along that almost are entirely indifferent to you. Like... Oh, I'm picking them up and moving them across the road that that kind of just and then they just keep on going that's incredible wow that'd be absolutely incredible to see it's really cool it's it's <laughs> it's yeah I mean it's just you're just cruising down kind of middle of nowhere almost New Mexico Kansas and then it's what is that weird black thing in the middle of the road and oh no it's a Oklahoma brown tarantula and yeah, that's, they're just all males. And for like a solid month, that's what it's like every night. You just see males just looking for lit, looking, knocking on the doors of ladies. Oh, wow. Good for them. Like, you know, I hope they get it. Like, that's, wow, that's pretty incredible. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to, trying to think of, yeah, we don't have anything of that sort, at least that I'm aware of. Well, I know there's at least one species of tarantula in but I think they're more in Queensland, aren't they? Yeah, there's a lot of the semi-tropical. Yeah, that's further up north from okay. me. Yeah. So yeah. when you're when you go frogging, are you gonna hopefully find things other than cane toads? Or I don't actually yes. know too much about amphibian species in Australia, to be honest. Yeah, so we actually have a lot of um, uh, tree frogs here. Uh, so the a couple of the species that we look for are actually endangered species and they're parts of our research projects for other oh, cool. people. So um, I, I learned so much about frogs because the lab that I'm a part of is actually called the, uh, it's, so it's called the Conservation Science Research Group, but they used to be known as the frog lab because a lot of the constituents <laughs> or the colleagues would be frog people. Um, cool. And so, yeah, sort of piggybacked off from that. Um, but there's still lots of people who do frog work on the uh, green and golden bell frog and also the uh, little John's tree frog, which has now been separated into two subspecies, the northern and southern. Uh, and they, um, they're both, or they're, all three of those species are endangered. Cool. Um, you might actually might be able to shed a little bit more light on this because it's always something that's always kind of bugged me. Um, do you know or, or have any experience like with the weird taxonomy classifications or yes. reclassifications that happen so often? Like, why is that so contended between natural range, natural integration? And I'm aware that a lot has to do with um, with DNA and on a, on a, you know, on a, on a microbiological level, but do you know why it, uh, for whatever reason, it seems like every other year they're reclassifying things that aren't necessarily accurate based on kind of out in the world. Yeah. So, uh, it annoys me to be honest with you. But, um... <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's not me. It's not just me. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, um, but a lot of it does have to do with the, yeah, it's a lot more on the microbiological scale as to why they do these sort of reclassifications, um, to my knowledge. And then the thing is, is it does actually have to, it, it affects the way going forward in terms of conservation efforts as well. Mm -hmm. Um, because like, especially with the, uh, the little John's tree frog, which has now been separated into two species as of a couple of weeks ago, um, it actually, you know, we want to make sure to sort of look at the levels of inbreeding within those populations mm -hmm. um, and to determine if there's any kind of, you know, what sort of the bottleneck is for that genetic diversity and that sort of stuff. Um, and then obviously we have to, as soon as we get that information, then it's, you're able to sort of determine any type of protocol from then on in terms of breeding programs and 
everything else, uh, evaluations, and um, it also helps to towards the environmental protection agencies um, as well, because if they find out that, oh, we've got an endangered species, oh, you know, we can't, uh, or, you know, like industry can't mine on that area or, you know, whatever it is. So, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but to be honest, yeah, I'm still bloody annoyed by it. <laughs> right. Do you think there's so. motivation behind that for that reason? Like they're trying to figure out whether or not that they are, in fact, like same species or integrates in to help or hinder that process as far as, you know, industrial efforts? That's a really good question. Um, I know it's the, you know, the, the, uh, the cynic in me that's asking those things, but it's something that, you know, you, you can't necessarily entirely overlook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I trust, I mean, all of it ultimately at the end of the day it's all it's all for science you know to you know research and you know find out all the answers to life and everything like that um but I trust in some ways it could be a hindrance um just because if you've got all of these separations and that sort of stuff um you know how do you go forward you know you've got all these things that you've got to you know, you got to protect, but, you know, at the end of the day, like who's the sort of the umbrella species for it Mm -hmm. all. And if you've got all these species, well then how, how do you classify which one is more important to save, you know? So yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of, a lot to think about in those sort of things. Um, Yeah. I'm not sure exactly. I don't know if there's any right or wrong answer to that, though. Um, yeah, that is kind of or hindrance. So, yeah, I was just curious because yeah. I th- I would I would assume that you would have a little bit more of a regular day to day understanding of that process, and so it was just always something yeah. that I was curious about when all the sorts of different things like there's a whole thing going on with North American colubrids right now with the different subspecies and species of the different rat snakes and the classifications of pantheropus and all these other things that are making it very difficult for individual hobbyists and state legislation and all these crazy things. And so it's just something that as I move forward learning um, on kind of both ends of the spectrum, that just seems to be a re-existing, I guess, condition of it. And so I was just kind of curious if you had any insights of that at all, or the processes behind it. Sorry. Whenever it gets really warm in the house, when you have little geckos and things that eat fruit and powdered mixes and stuff, you get fruit flies. And when it's cold outside, because, you know, it's been snowing here for the last three days, so everything comes inside. So (laughs) also when you have fruit flies, you get black widows, which was a whole other thing that we've also been dealing with. (laughs) Yay! Oh, no, it's all good. Listen, I got this like mosquitoes and other sort of like little tiny insect gnats and stuff. So I totally yeah. understand what you mean. <laughs> um, I actually had a question for you. So I guess with that, then with all of the different classifications and whatnot, especially with, you know, rat snakes or different types of snakes in mm-hmm. the hobby thing. So then what a lot of the, uh, I guess you would get a lot of hybridization then happen. Um, right? they're they're finding that- a lot of that um okay. and they are worried about that exactly um so they're finding that in uh the natural overlapping range of the desert king snakes and the california king snakes in that kind of southern nevada california area they're finding natural intergrades um and there's and as well as desert kings and mexican black king snakes which i think those just got moved to vulnerable status. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, And they're wondering why that is, why they're integrating more and theirs are spreading. Whereas in Florida, they're seeing declines in the three different subspecies of uh, Florida king snakes, whose name I can't remember right now, Lampropeltis, I don't remember what it is. Um, but they are seeing a lot more of that integration as well as they are worried about that. So for, they're worried about, you know, corn snakes, Pantheropus gutatus. Oh, I think I just lost you. 
Uh oh. You're back. Okay, there okay. we go. Yay. Um, Sorry about you, that. We can't call it a podcast without some sort of technical difficulty, right? Um, of course. Yep. And then with, you know, our native Greater Plains rat snake in Colorado, Pantheropus emeri where they are and have been established as entirely different species for, I think, close to a decade. But they worry about, you know, naturally about artificial introduction via accidental release or what's happened in Florida all over the place and everywhere else in the world. Um, they're worried about that. And so I think that may have something to do with it where they're kind of worried about that. Um, like now... I don't know how much you knew, like there used to be three or four different types of rat snakes, like a Texas rat snake and Everglades rat snake and all these other things. Now it's just Eastern and Western. And now there's this weird oh. thing about fox snakes that kind of run the North central part of their range, which genetically they're very similar to the Eastern rat snakes, but they're in entirely something different. And so there are people trying to say, okay, are we just going to have a northern rat snake? And those are the fox snakes. And then in that range, there's in the northern, there's a subspecies northern and southern, which the northern parts up in Minnesota, and then the southerns reach down into kind of almost into Tennessee. So they are seeing, because they're paying more attention to populations, um, they're starting to see more natural integration and worried about future invasives integrating. So okay. yeah. at least that's my assumption. Um, it's ex ex exotic laws are kind of weird right now, um, which was not helped by the pandemic between um, state and federal people making, which may or may not have like PETA and other places like that kind of pushing it a little bit about possible, you know, zoonotic diseases spreading. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, stuff's kind of a bit in the up in the air right now. Yeah. I don't Yikes. know. Did I answer the question at all? I'm not really sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's crazy. Crazy it world is. we live in. I know there's, and on a less like scary note, I know that, um, the carpet pythons that, um, are there, I know there's been a lot of contention between the different if they are in fact different subspecies or not between um like the coastals and the darwins um and even up into what was called the irian jaya but are now just Papuans, and whether or not those are even though they're geographically isolated are they in fact still genetically close enough to be considered the same species as um morelia spilota spilota so I just, yeah. it's been that way forever. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it's crazy classification. Um, one thing I'll do to relate back to sort of like my PhD stuff. Um, so, and this goes along with that whole taxonomic stuff is mm -hmm. the, yeah, so chimpanzee paper. Um, yeah, we've had to, so... The terminology they don't like to be called or like people don't like it to be called um the common chimpanzee in fact it's rather the robust chimpanzee um but unfortunately the whole chimpanzee population they've got like you know a couple different you know uh subspecies so it's just kind of like well okay how do you classify it as just the robust chimpanzee but then you know what are the different you know sort of you know sub subspecies of those it's um it's been a lot to sort of take in as far as for all of that and I'm like it's just a chimpanzee <laughs> I mean that's <laughs> probably not the best researcher in me but I'm like okay guys like let's just you know get on the same page with all of this right yeah so exactly it's yeah <laughs> I think yeah, that's not shared I'm... kind of universally to be honest yeah exactly I mean they all need saving like <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> so anyway, that's just my little gripe as a, yeah, anyway. Yeah. That, hey, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I don't think there's too, too much else. Um, just really appreciate you coming on and talking with me like this. And I'm glad that none of the flying foxes have peed on you. Yeah, no, they, they have in the past, so. <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> 
<laughs> maybe i'm immune to corona at this point but no that was a shit joke sorry um but i don't know i don't know if you heard uh the kookaburras have been going off and we also had uh some of the sulfur crested cockatoos go off in the background too so i thought i yeah. heard a kookaburra but i wasn't sure i know they don't always sound like that very iconic uh vocalization that they do and i thought i heard it but i wasn't sure so. Yeah, that was that was definitely it. There was about three or four of them that had just flown into a tree and were doing it all together, and that's definitely their alarm call. Cool. Is so. that has okay? So I know that's it's still crazy for me that you know there's there's cockatoos and there's kookaburras and literally at any point in time you know a wallaby could scamper on through. That mm -hmm. has that become? Have you become at all jaded to that at all in the past you know three ish years, or is it still? Like, oh, holy moly, that's really cool. Yeah, no, there's still, there's so much magic in that. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know, like to be able to see that and see different, you know, wildlife at any point um, is, uh, it, there's something about it. it just makes me feel like a kid again. Um, and like, you know, I was a kid when I left Australia and coming back now as an adult, I'm like, okay, there's still that kid in there, you know, looking for, okay, what can we find next? Um, there's awesome. a couple of, you know, you know, you see brush turkeys in this area and there's just heaps of different things. And, um, just, uh, like moments before we talked, um, I saw a millipede and it was, you know, grooming itself and also it was drinking water and it was from this like little droplet it was it was freaking incredible I had to like document every single little thing so um that is cool. yeah definitely took up the hobby of photography especially living here because there's just so many different things to see so that's incredible yeah. I, oh man i would love to be able to go and <laughs> just spend even a day there i don't know what i would do for just a day but that would be absolutely cool a trip of a lifetime for me yeah well listen anytime you guys want to come over please feel free there's i've got a house so you guys are more than welcome to stay and can show Woo. you around all of this place so that yeah this incredible gotta start saving up we have to knock out a couple other expenses around here plus we're hoping for an, an alaska trip which um if i don't don't have much of a following on youtube at this point but Hopefully we have some stuff lined up with reptile keepers in Alaska too, coming up, hopefully fingers crossed next year. They had to cancel on all that stuff this one. So fingers crossed, we'll see, but absolutely. And I will totally take you up on that as soon as an opportunity comes forward. Believe me. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no worries. You know, no, quite a lot of uh, herpers here. So yeah, that could definitely happen. So you can yeah, see some really cool stuff. Do you ever do you ever go out into the outback to try to document stuff like that? Like out into the the part where you have to have rue insurance on your rental <laughs> car because it's not if it's when you hit one, which is yeah. unfortunate, but that's a thing. Yeah, no. So it's funny that you say that because um, uh, like the last time that I was in the outback was probably 1998-ish. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we actually, at that point, yeah, we had driven from Alice Springs all the way up to Darwin. And, Holy um, moly, that's, that's a trip. Yeah, definitely. That was definitely an amazing trip. Like, I still think about it to this day. And um, we did have a golden, uh, golden wedgetail eagle fly into our car and broke oh the God. windshield. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but um, I'm actually taking a trip uh next month around the thanksgiving holiday uh mm -hmm. to go to south australia and gonna go do a little road trip around there and also swim with great white sharks well cage dive with great white sharks so oh, oh, yeah that is that <laughs> is awesome i was so we we went to hawaii last september and i was so bummed we didn't see a tiger shark we only saw a few galapagos which was still really cool but I was so bummed we didn't get to see a tiger. I don't think it was the right time of year, but I'm super jealous. When, oh, when is typically <laughs> their um, sort of season for tiger sharks? Supposedly it was that type of season. It was that time of the season, but it was a little early. I, if I remember correctly, because um, the several of the different like tour guides or touristy people that are that live out there and take the, the tours around, 
Um, they're usually around the northern part of the island where we weren't were. And then as the month progresses, they end up kind of shoaling down further south to the other end of the island. And so because we went like 50, mm, no, I don't, we didn't, we only went like 15 miles offshore. Um, we were hoping that we might catch some like outlier males that were going to cruise around. Cause I, I've, I don't know as much about sharks, um, but I think that time of the year, a lot of the females hover around closer to shore that I think they're fattening up, but I don't know for sure, but that's really cool that you're going to go dive with some white sharks. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, definitely mentally preparing for it currently, but, um, yeah, no, definitely looking forward to doing even the road trip, like it's sort of near that, um, a little bit of a little bit more of the outback yeah so the way that Australia is kind of divided up for lack of a better term so a lot <laughs> of the rainforest is sort of you know up in that pocket of Queensland it's sort of a little bit into um, the Northern Territory and then uh, we start getting a bit of the temperate and coastal forests heading into uh, New South Wales um, but a lot of it is along the coast and then you know then you start getting more of the you know, savannah or grasslands type, you know, sort of where the rain, uh, where the forest and sort of rainforest ends. And then the outback is more like Western Australia, a uh, pocket of South Australia and uh, Northern Territory. And then like just tips of the corners of like Queensland and um, New South Wales. So, yeah, it's, um, what is it? Yeah, we do have mountains and we do have snow here in uh, New South Wales. So, yep. yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, it will be nice just to just go away just for a little while. <laughs> but that's cool. Anyway. That's really really cool. <laughs> Got to have some positivity there somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah <that's>... Sure. <laughs> hey, you're going froggy. There's nothing better than that, right? That's right. Anyway. Yep. <laughs> well no but um thank you so much for having me like thank you so much for conversing and it's been wonderful I really appreciate oh, yeah, no, it that's, it's great I didn't know I didn't know what this is certainly something that I am much more comfortable with it's really hard for me to just not ramble and explode and then miss things when I'm trying to do stuff in you know five minute little sections and I'm trying to take a subject that I can go for an hour on easily so this is something that I think is a lot better, but I didn't really feel too, too comfortable moving forward into a format like this yet. So um, you're my inaugural. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this. Um, Absolutely. I don't, it's not like I receive any real compensation or anything like that, but I really do appreciate uh, you coming on and giving your time. And it's been really great talking to somebody who's, you know, kind of has the same uh, idea about things moving forward in the world. So really, 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 really want to thank you so much for this. Well, and likewise, thank you for this opportunity. I mean, I'm not really great at like interviewing, like I'm not a confident person by any means, and this is just to help my skills. So thank you. Sure. <laughs> and yeah. plus, it's, plus, it's also really nice to talk about, you know, something that we're both passionate about. So it's, it's pretty awesome, pretty easy. <laughs> so. Yep. And that was close to an hour, I think. I'm not sure how long it went, but yeah, it was about an hour. Wow. Uh, cool. Yeah, time flies. Uh, yeah, definitely. I can definitely talk more about this, like, at any point. Like, totally, yeah.